Hello and welcome, my friends and viewers, to this week's episode of Legend Lore, where I draw and talk about monsters, characters, gods, and other things from D&D 5th edition, all while giving a small but quickly digestible history about them. Together we'll go over their history within the game, how they're utilized in the modern edition, and how you guys can utilize them in your own games. This week we'll be going over the Archdevil Levistus, frozen lord of Stygia, the fifth layer of the Hells. Once a swashbuckling swordsman beholden to the Nine Hells and the rule of Asmodeus, Levistus' actions saw him bound to the realm of Stygia for eternity, trapped within a prison of cold and his powers sorely diminished. Now he lies seated upon his frozen throne as a shadowy silhouette resting within the frigid ice. Levistus' true appearance is widely unknown, believed to be struck from all records and further attempts to try and punish him, and all who have dared venture into his lair find only a small bit of darkness nestled within a quarter mile deep within his icy slab. Most assumptions, however, paint Levistus as standing at around six feet tall with a lithe build, sporting dark hair and a sharp goatee and a pale complexion further waned by the cold. Some would say that he could pass for human were it not for his pointed teeth, sharp ears, and black shark-like eyes betraying his fiendish origin. When most mortals meet him, or rather aspects or projections of him, he wears loose, fine clothing and carries a shining rapier at his side. The air around him chilling while his clothes and self are partially frozen or dripping with water. Unable to physically move his body, Levisus' mind remained fully aware of his surroundings, with him being incredibly observant due to the solitary nature of his confinement. The maintaining and controlling of his unfathomable network of agents and plans is all that he really has to keep his mind occupied. And even prior to this, Levistus had proven himself to be clever, charming, and a very capable lord. In the time before his imprisonment, Levistus was known for challenging his enemies to single combat to the death, not only because of the great martial skill he possessed, but also out of some sense of personal honor and perceived fair play. However, this twisted form of chivalry did nothing to really better Levistus' penchant for betrayal, the archdevil often finding it physically difficult to resist double-crossing someone when either tempted or presented the opportunity. This has led to him making unnecessary changes to plans, burning bridges even when they still had their uses, and eventually committing such a terrible treachery that he was punished for it by never being able to physically move again. But with his body trapped, his mind would be allowed to race, brewing all manner of plans dealing with political intrigue, contracts, negotiations, and the creation of mistrust between the other archdevils themselves, including plans to overtake the surrounding territories of Stygia in hopes of attaining enough power to break his chains. Levisus was forced to use unconventional means toward this end, however, due to his lack of direct control over his domain. As such, he employed the Amnizu Devils as his loyal servants, primarily by inflating their egos and insisting that they themselves were above the infernal caste system in Hell, which in turn granted him immense favor with them. They have since then plotted against the other Archdevils and even schemed against Asmodeus himself to unfortunately disastrous ends. Which, speaking of Asmodeus, many believe that it was Levistus who was the first Archdevil to attempt to outwardly betray the King of Hell, but this was not the reason for his eternal imprisonment. Most say that it was because Levistus had murdered Asmodeus' consort at the time, the fiend Bensosia, who was also the mother of their daughter, Glacia, another Lord of Hell. But beyond that, there even lies a darker possible truth, one that paints Bensosia and Levistus as co-conspirators against the King of Hell until Glacia, ignorant of her mother's relationship with him, became smitten with Levistus herself. The Lord of Stygia confidently juggled these two affairs despite knowing that discovery would mean certain doom, and he would eventually be found out when Glacia walked in on him with her mother, whom she murdered in a violent, jealous rage. In order to save face and avoid humiliation, Asmodeus had Levistus framed for the murder and thusly imprisoned him within his icy realm in a purely rational move. Either one of these stories can work for your table, depending on how dark and twisted you'd like your devils to be, with Glacia's hatred for Levistus being born of either a vengeful child's love for their mother, or a broken heart. You can even have Glacia still pine for the Archdevil, working against her father in a plot to attempt to try and free him from his frosty imprisonment. As I said before, Levistus was quite the swordsman before his entrapment, wielding legendary skill and capable of ascertaining and deflecting his opponent's every move, whilst also still painting it with a flamboyant flair. He was resistant to cold and could manipulate it just as well as fiends wielded fire, and his touch could drain the very memories of his foes, wiping their knowledge from the past and allowing him to fill the gaps with his own truths. With all this, he was still outfitted with the standard archdevil powers and command over legions upon legions of devils, but Levistus' favorite weapon was his good old enchanted rapier, whose touch he missed for all the time that he was trapped within the ice. He is also believed to wield a sword breaker dagger of some sort. For a stat block containing most of his cannon abilities, I definitely recommend checking out the GM Binders take on him, linked in the description below. In terms of allies and foes, Levistus is probably the most hated archdevil out of all of them, 
often the subject of ridicule due to his low favor with Asmodeus. His focus on only elevating himself at the expense of others and clear disregard for the rules of the infernal caste system left most fiends keen on not having anything to do with him. Asmodeus in particular bears Levistus the illest of wills, both due to his action regarding his consort and daughter and the latter's utter lack of gratitude for being able to keep both his station and his life. Glacia, the lord of the Sixth Slayer and Asmodeus' aforementioned daughter, holds a personal love-hate relationship with Levistus. Some say that she's keen to annihilate him, while others believe that she is still in love with him, but nobody really knows the truth. And then there's the archdevil Gurion, Levistus' arch-nemesis. The two have battled over control of Stygia for eons, and Levistus' entrapment has left Gurion unable to actually attack him, so as to finally usurp control. In regards to mortals, Levistus was always keen to meet those who were seeking an audience, so long as they were judged worthy company by his trusted advisors and bought gifts such as treasure, information, or a suitable mass of souls. Even then, it is said that he would often force visitors to wait years before finally conversing with them in person, despite being able to actually telepathically communicate with anybody within his realm. When it came to tempting mortals, however, Levistus opted against the approach of maximizing corruption by targeting large populations, which was favored by most devils. Rather, he would always focus on the outcasts or the undesired within society, and this change in prey meant that Levistus was free to act without the worry of turning mortal society's eye onto him, as well as avoiding conflict with his contemporaries who operated within such spaces. Levistus took this further and painted himself as a patron of the forgotten, the traitorous, and the vengeful, gladly taking in those who had committed acts so terrible in their quest for revenge that their souls could never truly ever be washed clean. Furthermore, Levistus was keen to keep himself informed on which fiends fell out of favor within the infernal caste system, keen to recruit or otherwise involve them in his schemes. He would even go as far as to stockpile souls within his chambers while starving his own forces, offering a taste of this feast for those who betrayed their masters and decided to serve him instead. In terms of the worship of Levistus, his holy symbol is that of a rapier being stabbed through a block of ice, and rituals done in devotion to Levistus include ice being melted within iron cauldrons filled with boiling water, to symbolize Levistus' desire for release. His disciples were often commanded to search for items and information that would be valuable to devils that were in the service of other lords, so that Levistus could use them as bargaining chips to bring them into his own service. Levistus as a warlock patron rewarded his worshippers with the ability to draw upon the power of the realm of Stygia itself, casting cold spells and being able to resist low temperatures. Some could even use the power of Levistus to seal themselves within ice temporarily to avoid harm, reflected mechanically as the Tomb of Levistus Eldritch Evocation. The most powerful of Levistus cultists had the capability to send souls of mortals to a place known as the Hall of Vanquish within Stygia. Heroes, Archons, Angels, and Devils alike were trapped in dramatic poses atop pedestals of ice, alongside the tactics that Levistus had developed himself when facing similar threats. Levistus would even temporarily release these captures to force them to practice against his Devil Legions, training them for an eventual further conflict. Shrines and places of worship dedicated to Levistus were very far and few between, his worshippers either remaining solitary or keeping to small numbers on the fringes of society. Many of Levistus' followers were those who swore vengeance against another person, often falling deep into depravity at the hands of the Archdevil's temptations. Levistus would sometimes push these individuals to meet, allowing their mutual need for satisfaction to fuel one another, until a sect of Levistus' cultus could be born. Another aspect of Levistus' worship is his place as a patron of survival, as along with his imprisonment, Asmodeus has cursed him to always offer those in life-threatening danger a chance to escape. As such, he would grant these individuals a second chance at life, teleport them to safety, or give them a singular use of this second chance at a time in the future when they most needed it, all often at the cost of their own soul. Likewise, Levistus would make use of the other side of the fence, having his followers serve as bounty hunters who would offer their prey salvation and safety from the law in exchange for serving the Archdevil. His most devout mortal followers, also known as Blade Reavers, forsook the common appearance of hooded cultists with rune daggers and blood sacrifices in favor of wielding rapiers and other dexterous weapons while wearing flamboyant outfits more commonly seen on daring swashbucklers or even bards. In all actuality, calling these Blade Reavers cultists is actually a bit of a stretch, as most of them operated alone and were very quick to betray those that they temporarily aligned with. This concept could definitely make for a very interesting NPC or even a PC. Now, I unfortunately haven't gotten the chance to involve Levistus in any of my campaigns, but I believe I would do very little to change his portrayal if I were to bring him into my game. His cold and cunning yet charming persona is wonderful for a villain, but I could also imagine that he can struggle with keeping his desperation to escape his chains from bleeding into his deals, negotiations, and threats. He's self-aware, and he realizes that he is actually in a very difficult position. As while his prison offers a great deal of physical protection, he is isolated, trapped, and often at the mercy of the same people that he tempts into damnation. 
As such, Levistus does everything that he can to betray himself as being the one with all the power, always manipulating his enemies against one another so that they never think to focus on him, whilst also making sure that his loyal subjects are always flattered, manipulated, or duped into enacting his will. If questions begin to arise, he is quick to kill them and consume their soul before moving on to the next one. But before all that, he is charming and almost bardic in his personality, and I could see him rewarding Gusto and having confidence in the skill to back it up would quickly earn his attention. If you wish to have a character serve Levisus or have him be involved in their backstory, make use of the Archdevil's penchant for offering second chances, having saved the PC or NPC from death in exchange for either their soul or their service. This is great for a warlock of the Fiend patron, as well as any of the darker cleric domains or maybe even a bard keen to emulate Levisus' swashbuckling ways. You can also use the angle of people seeking revenge and reverence of Levistus for an Oath of Vengeance Paladin, Rogue, or any other class really. The Hexblade Warlock can also be gifted a lesser version of Levistus' trusty Enchanted Rapier, with it growing in power the more favor that the Warlock gains. His Stiflings are also something that I would imagine are actually more common than other Archdevils, due to Levistus' whoring ways and his penchant for keeping to the outcasts of society. However, I definitely would recommend changing his Hellish Resistance to Cold Damage instead of Fire for flavor reasons. Quests for the Archdevil can include attempting to capture a powerful foe to fill a space in Vistus' Hall for the Vanquished, assassinating a powerful figure that serves a rival Archdevil, searching for an item that is important for another Archdevil or creature in order to bend them to his service, and so on. On the opposite end, you can have a good party encounter cult members attempting to capture them for the Hall of the Vanquished, as their deeds and prowess have reached Vistus' own ears and he covets them for his collection. You can even have a party be called to journey to the hall to free some powerful individual that has been captured, earning both the favor of the quest giver and the entity that you freed. You can also possibly be ordered to steal back an item that Levis has stolen in order to alleviate his pressure on the quest giver. Lastly, a higher level quest would include attempting to try and break Levisus out of his prison, either against his will or by his own orders, as doing so would allow him free reign once again, but also leave him open to attack and assassination by his many enemies. Not to mention the party may earn the ire of Asmodeus himself. Or, perhaps it's something that Asmodeus really wished for all along, urging the party to do so as he has finally reached a point where Levisus is no longer useful to him. You could even touch a bit on Levistus and Glacia's relationship by including two Tiflin characters of those respective bloodlines, urged towards finding one another to either be together or to slay one another depending on your approach. And lastly, for our magic item this video, we have Levisus' rapier that I've taken to calling Wind Chill. It is a plus 3 rapier that deals 1d8 piercing plus 1d6 cold damage and contains 6 charges that can be used to cast the following spells. For one charge, you can cast the spell Gift of Gab and Rhymes Binding Ice. For two charges, you can cast the spells Ice Storm and Haste, and for three charges, you may cast the spells Wall of Ice and Modify Memory. Additionally, once per long rest, you may use this weapon's special ability, Spell Deflection. When struck by a spell or forced to make a saving throw against the spell, the wielder may use their reaction to grant themselves advantage on the saving throw or to give the spell attack disadvantage. If the spell fails to hit or the wielder succeeds their saving throw, the caster of that spell now suffers the same effect as the spell they just cast. They must now make a saving throw against the spell or suffer the effects, or roll a spell attack against themselves to see if they hit. I've included the item stop block in the description below. And that's Levisus, everybody. I want to thank all of you guys for watching, and if you guys enjoyed the video, please like, share, and subscribe, and comment down below. And if you guys want to vote on the next video, you can follow the link in the description to decide which D&D class I'll be covering this week. Your choices being the Ranger, the Fighter, and the Warlock. And please let me know how you guys have encountered Levisus in your games, how you intend to use him in your games, and what other things you guys would like to see in upcoming videos. But until then, I'll see you guys next time.